Today, we are continuing the series, Vineyard of God. Vineyard of God, and this is part three. I'm, I've just been loving this series. I know all of you wine fanatics, uh, you have been loving this series. I've been like taking a deep dive into the whole culture of winemaking, which is called viticulture. Didn't know this, but now I do. Um, and uh, just, a, just a little like heads up, I told you at the beginning of this series that we were gonna talk about new beginnings, that that was gonna be a theme in this series, and today we're definitely gonna get into that. But I want you to know that Jesus is a winemaker. Jesus is the best kind of winemaker. Yeah. Um, he is like a sommelier. He knows the culture of wine. He knows the kind of wine that he's trying to create. And in preparation for this series, I've been uh, kind of perusing through a book that a friend of mine let me borrow called Wine Simple because I've just been trying to learn the culture that goes into winemaking and how that relates with what the scripture has to say. It's by a guy named Aldo Som, who's a professional uh, sommelier, and he's like worked in like three-star Michelin restaurants and all of this stuff. Uh, he's very renowned. But he says this about winemaking. He says, so many factors contribute to what the wine becomes, the type of grape, where it's grown, when and how the grapes are picked. All these decisions are made by the winemaker who transforms something elemental into something monumental. This is what God desires to do with us, is transform us, not into something just ordinary, not into something just elemental, but something extraordinary and something monumental. Like a chef working with similar ingredients, it's really the winemaker who determines what the wine becomes. And Jesus is our winemaker. God loves to make new wine. Hello? And I've called this morning's message, How to Make New Wine. How to Make New Wine. Luke chapter 5 is where we're going to be at for the most part today. If you have a Bible, it'll also be up on the screen. Let me read these verses. They said to him, this is the Pharisees saying to Jesus, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. And they're talking not just about drinking water. Hello. Why would they say eating and drinking if they're just talking about water? Talking about wine. Jesus answered, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they will fast. So basically, just to understand what Jesus is saying, he's the bridegroom. He's there present on the earth. And he's saying, it wouldn't make any sense for the people who are partying with the bridegroom to fast while the bridegroom's around. A wedding is made for partying, right? And so Jesus is saying, my disciples aren't fasting right now because I'm here. But one day when I go and return to my Father in heaven, then they will fast. And we've just finished a 21-day journey of prayer and fasting. And some of you are like, hallelujah, thank God. In verse 36, he told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say, the old is better. Can we pray? God, thank you for your word this morning that it is truth, it is life. It encourages us, it admonishes us, it corrects us. Help us to understand what your word is saying so that we can live it out for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. This chair is bothering me. I feel like I'm gonna move over here, so clear path. All right, <laughs> Isaiah 43, 19. Maybe you've heard this verse before. I wanna reference it in relation to this. It says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? Here's one thing that I have learned about God is that he loves to do new things. God is not up in heaven repeating his greatest hits. Now, I'm a big fan of you too. My wife and I are actually gonna go see you too. 
in the near future. And they're actually redoing their Octune Baby tour. They're bringing back that album from the early 90s and they're bringing it into modern day and all this stuff. And, and I'm a fan of U2, so I'm down for it. But I used to live with a, a friend who was also a big fan of U2 and every single morning on his boom box, he would insert a compact disc into it and play U2's greatest hits. And I love U2, but I was sick of them after living with my friend. Because every morning he's like, t you know, he's like blasting it, you know, 7 a.m. He's getting ready for work. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I'm like, dude, you need to find it. Because I cannot listen to this anymore. I think some of us think that God is like that. That he's just up in heaven repeating endlessly his greatest hits. Oh, remember when I split the water? The Red Sea, it parted. You remember when I fed the 5,000? Like, let's take a look back at that. Oh my gosh, that was so amazing. And, and maybe we don't think God's like that, but I think we're like that. We just look back on what God did and we constantly repeat it. And sometimes we almost are living in the past. We're like Uncle Rico in Napoleon Dynamite. And we're just trying to like revisit our high school football glory days. And how we threw the football over the mountain and, and whatever. And God's like, I want you to know something. Hello, I want to do a new thing. Yeah. I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. The word new in Hebrew that is used here, behold, I am doing a new thing. It's actually the same word that's used in the creation account. When God spoke the earth into existence. And so he's saying with the same force and the same creativity and the same beauty that I hurled the universe into existence with the words from my mouth, I want to speak into your life and mine in creating a new thing. Amen. That's the kind of new thing that God wants to do in your life and that God wants to do in my life. And so if God is into new things, I think we should be into new things. I think we should want to be on the cutting edge of what God wants to do. And not be content to live in the past, but even embrace and adopt creative methods that we can use to reach people with the gospel. God is creative. He will not allow himself to be boxed in. Any creative in this room knows what it's like when somebody tries to pigeonhole you. You're like, no. Nah. My friend Chels, he has an album called No Genre. Because he's like, I'm not going to be confined to any one genre. I wanna express myself in a way that is creative and God is always into doing new things. But if he's gonna do new things, he's gotta put them in the appropriate container. New wine goes into new wineskins. As I've been researching viticulture, <laughs> I've found that, that when new wine is barreled, they always put it in a new barrel because they don't want the wine from the barrel that has been used before and then kind of soaked into the wood to then affect the flavor that the new wine is now being put in because it will start to absorb some of the stuff that made the other wine what it was if it's put into an old container. New wine, new container. And so God is saying to us this morning, I wanna do a new thing but it takes a new container. One of the containers that people have tried to confine God to is this, a system. A system. One of the old wineskins that you will that we try to force God into is a system. And this passage is actually very much highlighting that truth. Because if you read the account of the Pharisees critiquing Jesus and his disciples, and then you go to what happens afterwards, how they try to accuse him of breaking the Sabbath, they're trying to put him in a box of their system, their religious system. And by the way, it wasn't even God's system because they were creating their own rule book and their own rules. They added all these extra laws onto the laws that God had given the children of Israel because they were like, we're going to go above and beyond. We're going to be so religious. We're so spiritual. We're, we're going to make sure that we obey every single commandment that God has said, including the ones that he hasn't said. 
And Jesus is like, you ain't going to put me in that box. <laughs> Hello, I made the rule book. I'm very familiar with what's inside of it. And I am the fulfillment of the rule book. Yeah. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And so I think sometimes we are getting frustrated with things that are associated with faith and Christianity, but could it be that people have created and crafted rules that were never what God actually intended? I would encourage us to think outside of the box, but inside of the book. God's word doesn't change. We just need to understand what it says. Think outside the box and inside the book. But the Pharisees, they thought they were going to be esteemed by God if they kept all of the rules. It's something called legalism. And maybe you've been negatively affected by legalism. Maybe you've been at a church that was all about legalism. You're good if you do X, Y, and Z, but if you do A, B, and C, you out of here. Jesus isn't like that. And we can't approach our relationship to Jesus like that. Galatians 3.24, it says it like this. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The law was never intended to be the end. It was intended to be a means to show us that we actually need a savior. Yeah. And so the, the analogy that Paul's using is that of a schoolmaster back in this day who would take the student to the teacher. He would make sure that the student got to the teacher so that he could learn from the teacher. And so he's saying the law was just meant to hold your hand so that you could get to Christ. And Christ is the fulfillment of the law. And once you meet him, you're free from the law because Jesus has fulfilled the law. The law is a system that is supposed to show us our need for a savior. So if you try to put the living, breathing relationship that we have with God into the dormant, dead, and lifeless container of religion, it will bust out of it. It can't contain it because our relationship with God is alive and it's vibrant. And going back to John chapter two, we're going to like full circle this whole series today. We began in John chapter two where Jesus turned the water into wine. And I said in that message, we're going to circle back to some of this because it'll make more sense in the context of all of this. But if you go quickly back to John chapter two and verse six, it says, now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servant, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. This is symbolic. The container was for what? The purification ritual, the law, legalism, thinking that you are made right before God by observing all of these commandments. And what does Jesus do? He changes the water into wine. The, the wine symbolism can have different connections, but in this case, the wine is symbolic of the blood of Jesus. He's saying it's not this water, it's not this ritual, it's not this legalism that makes you right before me. It's my blood that makes you clean. It's my blood that gives you the ability to approach God. It's my blood that gives you the forgiveness of sins. It's my blood that changes your life and makes you a new creation. Quit trying to approach God through the law. It will never get you there. You're only going to get there through the blood. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that purifies us from our sins. That's why Jesus said in, in Matthew 26 when he's Having the Lord's Supper that we call it now, the Last Supper with the disciples, he says, take this cup for this is my blood of the covenant. And what was that cup? It was wine. He was saying, this is symbolic of my blood. So awesome. So a system can never get you into a relationship with God. It's an old wineskin, an old container. Here's another container that I think we try to force God into. It's the container of style. The container of style. Now, what do I mean by style? I'm not talking about your fashion sense. Although Jesus does talk about trying to put a new fabric onto an old piece of clothing. And anybody have trouble? I, like my clothes, 
I don't know what happens. I'm just, I guess I'm just not very good with the whole washing and drying situation because like half of my wardrobe is like halter tops now. <laughs> so some Sundays you're like, Pastor, what are you wearing? I'm like, I, just, I can't, <laughs> can't buy a new wardrobe every service. I'm not Judah Smith. <laughs> I got to work with what I got, y'all. <laughs> but a wineskin that we try to force Jesus into is a style sometimes of how we've seen him move in the past. We've seen God do something maybe in a certain period of time, maybe in a certain type of church, maybe in a, a, a certain expression. And we've said in our minds, that's the way that God moves. And so we try to force everything into that container. But Jesus is saying, I can't be contained to that container. When you look at movements of God throughout history, they've oftentimes taken a lot of different looks. Maybe you've seen that movie that recently came out called The Jesus Revolution. It's on Netflix now. If you haven't seen it, I'd highly encourage you to. And I don't just say that because I hate 99% of Christian movies. This one's well done. It's good. And I think that you should see it. And it documents the revival that took place in the 60s and the 70s where all these people came to know Jesus. And it was a lot of hippies. And in that day, hippies were the untouchables to a lot of Christians. Like, I don't understand. This is this weird counterculture, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They don't shower. They don't bathe. They're like doing all sorts of stuff that I don't approve of. And a lot of religious people look down their nose at hippies. But then God's like, hey, guess what? You can't put me in a container. I'm going to reach the hippies. Amen. And all the hippies started getting saved. Wow. And then they started coming to church with no shoes on or sandals. And they had long hair and they played rock and roll music with acoustic guitars. And people in church were like, this is not okay. You know, God is in the organ. He's not in the guitar. <laughs> but what was happening, here's what was happening, is new wine was being created. And God was putting the new wine in a new container, a new expression that people of that generation, of that culture could understand. In fact, many movements of God have been closely connected with music because music is how we express ourselves. Music is how we connect spiritually. Music is, is a reflection of our culture. And so God saves people and then he uses them to redeem the culture. And this goes back to like the Protestant Reformation when Martin Luther would take bar tunes and then change the lyrics and make them into gospel songs. Yeah. And this type of thing has been happening throughout history. Now, the Jesus movement was awesome. And I grew up in a church that was started during the Jesus movement. Calvary Chapel churches, they spread all over the country and the world. And I grew up in Kansas and my mom went to a Calvary Chapel church and I learned a lot of great things there and I, and I loved it. But what I noticed as I continued on in Calvary Chapel over time is not, not every Calvary, but in some instances, this new container that God was using to reach people became its own system that people felt like they had to do to reach people. And so they started getting, in some ways, legalistic. Because here's the truth. Methods are many, principles are few. Methods may change, but principles never do. We can change the method all day long. We can meet in this building, we can meet in a bar, we can meet in a church, we can meet at Tangent Gallery after a lot of prayer. <laughs> we, we, can meet, we can meet anywhere because... God can't be confined to a certain expression, a certain type of church. And here's what I believe, and I kind of even like prophetically feel like I need to share this this morning, is that I believe God wants to do something so profound in, the, in Gen Z. Amen. And it's going to look so different. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to let it look different. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to look the same. And that is okay. We need to embrace that generation and not like push them off. 
We gotta quit telling them that they're the worst generation of all time and, and that they're not gonna amount to anything and all of this ridiculousness. That's the, the hippies, if you will, of our generation, you know? Gen Z, I believe, is gonna see a, a revival. And when you see things like even what happened in Asbury about a year ago where, where these students just started seeking God, it was so simple, there was no flash. There's no smoke machines and LED walls. Like, it was just simple. And maybe that's the new container, you know? It, it doesn't matter what the container is. It matters what the message is. It matters what the Holy Spirit does. But a lot of times, we pray for things, and God gives us answers to them, but then we send them back because the package doesn't look like we expected it to. I remember before this church started, a friend of mine made that neon sign that's in the back, cross and anchor. And he shipped it to my apartment. And I was expecting it, eagerly awaiting it. And one day it showed up in our apartment building. And I looked down and I wish I had a picture to show you. The box, the way it was shaped, it looked like I had been shipped an assault rifle. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it looked like a handle and you could put the magazine or whatever. I'm not really, I don't know much about guns, but like it looked like that's what was in the box. And it would have been real easy for me to be like, I didn't order an assault rifle and just like, UPS, take it back to the sender. See, a lot of times we pray for things and then they arrive at our doorstep in a different package. And we send it back because it's not what we expected. But God wants to do something new. God wants to do something different. And it may not look like what you're used to, but it's gonna be filled with new wine. Blessed are the flexible, for they will not be broken. <laughs> Here's another thing, last thing, kind of container that we put God into, I think, is there's the container of system, the container of style, and then the container of season. There's new seasons. We're in a new season. Today, I think, actually is the official first day of fall. So you thought we were in fall after Labor Day, but you were wrong. Fall started today, and the calendar goes in seasons, and so does the calendar of our life, operates in seasons. And something that may be good in one season might not be good in another season. Like you don't want to wear your snow pants to go to the beach, right? And you don't want to wear your shorts to go skiing. One thing that works in one season doesn't work in another season. You have to understand the season that you're in and dress accordingly. I, uh, I went to a funeral once of a close friend, and it's, you know, it was tragic. His daughter passed away very unexpectedly. And we got an email for those of us who were attending the funeral because his daughter loved the color red. And um, the church that we were all a part of, that was kind of like one of the main colors in their branding, and she loved that red. And so they said, let's all wear uh, things of red to the funeral. And... Uh, this is where the very sad, tragic story turns uh, somewhat like ridiculous on my part because I did not understand that email. And I had at that time a pair of red pants. And so I showed up to the funeral in these bright red pants. And I was the only person who was doing that. Everybody else had like little handkerchiefs or like a little button or something that had like red on it. But I thought I was supposed to like... Like, I, I was like, where's the red tuxedos and like the, the you know, uh, I, I didn't, the red dresses. I showed up wearing the wrong thing. You don't want to go to a certain occasion wearing the wrong thing. But sometimes we're not prepared for the season that God has us in and we're dressed in the wrong stuff. And we're trying to hold so desperately onto a past season that was so beautiful. But God's like, hey, I've got a new season for you. But the reason we stay in the old season is because we're afraid of what's unfamiliar. We would rather have predictable, even if it's bad, we'd rather have predictable than something that's new and unknown. And so we'll hold on to what we're familiar with all the while it can be inhibiting our growth and killing our life. Here's what I want to encourage you with this morning is two things. One is that the new is better than the old. The new is better than the old. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter two, after he turns the water into wine and he's talking to the master of the feast, 
The master tells him in verse 10, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus saved the best for last. The new is better than the old. And this is one of the miracles of Jesus because if you know anything about wine, it's usually the older wine that is better and has more flavor and more time for all of the notes of the profile to come out so that you can experience it on your taste bud. But Jesus is able to perform miracles that make the new thing that he's doing as if it had been aged for a long time. Because when God is working, he's bringing his eternal sense of time into the project that he's completing. And because he's not bound to time, he's able to make something fresh immediately. How many know that when God created Adam and Eve, Adam didn't pop out as a baby? He's a man, right? Like God didn't need the process for him to grow up. He could just put him on earth, right? God can do things in your life. Maybe there's things you're like waiting for. And and I know that God sometimes does have us wait, but he's able to do things immediately. He's able to take years and years and years worth of stuff and pack it into a moment. That's why Jesus says in in the passage that we read in Luke 5, he says, no one after they drink the old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. And there's many of us that whether you get your wine from a box or whether you spend a year's salary on the wine that you get, and there's all sorts of wine and everything in between, it doesn't matter if you drink it, it's going to affect you and eventually get you drunk. And people, they're drinking the old wine and it's working. And so they're like, the old is good. I'll just keep doing what I've been doing. No need to try something new. I know that this is going to have an effect on me, but I just want to encourage you that the new wine that Jesus is offering you is something that no sommelier has ever tasted in the history of humanity. It's something so profound and so intricate and so beautifully made that it will blow your mind. And the wine that he wants to make the most is the new wine he wants to make out of you. He wants to make new wine in your life. He wants to take the ordinary you and he wants to transform you radically into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. He wants to create you anew on the inside. He wants to pour his new life into you through his spirit. The new wine is also symbolic of the spirit of God. I was reading as I was getting ready for this series about different things that affect wine as it's being prepared and made. And it's just so incredible. If wine, for example, like a a cluster of grapes for a harvest, if it has been through something in a previous season, like if there was a flood, if there was a storm, if there was a fire, the notes of what it's been through come out in the flavor of it after it's processed. So you'll drink some wine And you're like, hold on, what year is this? 2018. Oh, wasn't there a fire in Napa Valley? Yes, I can taste that in the grape that's been made into wine. And there's some of us, we've been through some stuff in life. And it's coming out in the flavor of our life. And maybe some of it's been bad. And it's been bitter. And you didn't want to go through it, but you went through it. And now when people come around you or just even in your own life, you're tasting the bitterness of that season that you've been through. And this is the beauty, is that God can take all of those things and he can craft a beautiful wine out of it. And also what he can do is he can make completely new wine. And he can take all of that stuff from the past that should affect the flavor profile of your wine and he can transform it in an instant to where when people get around you, I just think of that verse when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown in the fire. It says after they got pulled out, they didn't smell like smoke because God had taken them out of it and they weren't affected by it to where it was pulling them down. Like, I just can't believe when Nebuchadnezzar threw us in that fire or what was it? They didn't even smell like smoke. God can make you into new wine if you will allow him to. I believe that this is a new wine season in our church. I believe God wants to make new wine out of us. 
I believe God wants to do incredible things in our midst if we will be willing to flex and mold and adapt and learn and grow. Listen, if you want to make new wine, you've got to be willing to grow. You can't stay the same. You've got to be willing to change and let God mold you and shape you. But the promise is that he will do it. Through his spirit, he will make you into the best wine that anyone has ever tasted. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. See, the solution for not putting God in a system, for not putting God in a style or in a season is his spirit. His spirit is the container. His spirit is what makes us new so that we can hold his new wine in our lives. His spirit is what transforms us. And there's many of us today, we've been running our head kind of like, we feel like we're just running into a brick wall constantly and we can't move forward. And it's because we're trying to do it in our own strength. And Jesus says, the scripture says, not by might nor by strength, but by my spirit. I've got to do the work. I'm going to ask Austin to come up and we're going to close today. He's making new wine out of us. George MacDonald, famous famous author, philosopher, Christian, he said this, I would rather be what God chose to make me than the most glorious creature that I could think of. For to have been thought about, born in God's thought, and then made by God is the dearest, grandest, and most precious thing. God wants to transform you into something that's new. And it will blow your mind when you see it and when others around you see it. But he's got to make you into a new creation so that you can house his wine. I felt like God spoke to me and I was, as I was studying John 2 a while back because I noticed that Jesus told the servants to go and grab the jars that were there and fill them with water. And then he transformed the water into wine. And I realized that as a church or as a pastor, there's been times where I've relied on trying to import wine versus God just taking the water that was already here and transforming it into wine. And so I've thought at times, oh, we got to get this person here. We got to do this thing. We got to bring in this outside source. And I'm relying on wine from other places instead of looking right in front of me and seeing the people that God has placed here and seeing that God wants to change them and me into wine. Do you want to be transformed this morning? Do you want to leave your old life behind? Do you want to experience the new life that Christ has for you? Do you want to allow him to come inside of you and make you a new person? He does it through the power of his spirit. Can we stand as we close this service today? God, thank you. You're making new wine out of us. Lord, I pray that you would, in this room this morning, bring people to know you. People would have their perspectives changed about who you are, that they would quit thinking about this like a religion or a system, but a relationship that's alive and breathing. Lord, would you take us and would you transform us? And as we close today, I just want to give an opportunity. If there's anyone here who'd like to say, yes, I want God to transform me into the person that he created me to be. I'm tired of the old. I want the new. I want to walk into the new life that Jesus has for me, then what I would love for you to do is just raise your hand so that I can pray for you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We say, yes, I want to follow him. I want him to make new wine out of me. Awesome. Awesome. For those who are wanting to make that decision this morning, it's, it's not anything you can do that earns this. It's just faith. And I want you just in simple faith to say, God, would you come into me and would you make me new? I give my life to you. Change me from the inside out. I want to be your son, your daughter. I don't want to experience your new life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.